Hello. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Marksu, uh, whose article is joint winner of the Review of International Studies Annual Prize for the best article published uh, in the journal in uh, 2021. Um, Maria is a senior researcher at the Center for Military Studies in the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. And Maria has published on ontological security, securitization of historical memory and hybrid warfare, and is the author of uh, the monograph, The Politics of Becoming European, a study of Polish and Baltic post-Cold War security imaginaries. Maria's article, Militant Memocracy in International Relations, Monomical Status Anxiety and Memory Laws in Eastern Europe, was published in Review of International Studies, volume 47, number four. Um, and a link will be uh, in the notes uh, accompanying this video if you want to kind of uh, follow up and read the article. And the article theorizes the relationship between um, uh, mnemonical status anxiety and militant memory laws, really legislation about uh, memories, uh, particularly in Russia, Poland and Ukraine. Um, and the article extends our understanding of status seeking in international relations uh, to the realm of historical memory by showing the quest for memory recognition is a status struggle. And it's a struggle about the sort of international social hierarchy of remembering the past. Um, and uh, Maria does a really effective job of showing that kind of what she calls militant memocracy is in danger of resounding rather than fixing uh, states' anxiety problems over the past. Um, and the judges were very fulsome in their praise for this article. Um, they noted it was an excellent and timely article which provides a novel theorization of the nexus between memory, history, and the international system through the innovative concept of militant memocracy, which is an original framework for understanding how states and other actors govern historical memory. And in doing so, the article pushes the boundaries of both current memory studies and approaches to international status by showing the role that interna international contestation over memory laws and policy plays both in the formation of memory and in the international social positioning of states. Um, the article unpacks these processes through an empirically rich and nuanced account of memory politics in three states uh, in the Central European region, Russia, Poland, and Ukraine, demonstrating the global political states, uh, sorry, the global political stakes of states' efforts to govern how national histories can and cannot be told. Um, the analysis not only shows how memory laws play into status anxiety and status-seeking behavior, but also draws attention to the exclusions and erasures that ensue. So really kind of high praise from, 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 from our judges. Um, it was really deserving winner. I really enjoyed reading it, Maria. Um, so I think we'd like to just start with a sort of general kind of background question really, which is sort of what, what drew you to the topic? How did you become interested in the politics of memory and uh, the way in which the politics of memory intersect with questions of status seeking? Thanks very much, uh, Martin, and thank you for this extremely generous uh, introduction and, of course, for the prize. It's uh, so, uh, so lovely to win prizes, which doesn't happen that often. But, of course, I guess the easiest answer to that question is that memory simply matters. It matters a lot. It matters for its effective charge to people. It matters to polities that people form. And... Um, uh, politics of memory actually is, I would argue, increasingly consequential for politics at large. And this, of course, seems to be particularly the case in Eastern Europe, as you know, not in the last order is also amply proven by the current uh, Russian uh, war against Ukraine, uh, because it appears as if getting a particular state story across internationally, getting it acknowledged and recognized is almost amounting to getting oneself worth uh, somehow validated, recognized. And these questions uh, have been the questions I've always been very interested in because also I come from the region. I've been working on certain elements of this uh, question that is also underpinning this very article since the tail end of my doctoral work. So from about 2007, uh, when, when in Estonia, in my hometown in Tallinn, there was this big commotion uh, over uh, the replacement of a Soviet war memorial. And in a way, still the Soviet past does not want to pass in the region. When it comes to status seeking, then um, how this is related is, of course, again, 
because identity and memory are fundamentally intertwined. And if we follow the basic sort of constructivist logic that uh, status is something that is embedded in an actor's identity, and then memory is, of course, a fundamental temporal dimension of any identity, then, then uh, this uh, was, was crying out uh, for further exploration in the context of status seeking. Uh, as I think it hadn't really been addressed uh, uh, that much yet. Yeah, and actually, I think that's what's really fascinating. I mean, we've got quite a lot of work on sort of memory in international politics and also quite a lot bit on status seeking, but you bring them together in a really kind of compelling way that helps us to understand things like history laws in places like Poland, for example. I think that's really, um, really one of kind of the sort of key contributions. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how memory plays a role in, in, in status seeking in international politics. Mm -hmm. So I guess, particularly when we get to these, these memory laws, which in and of themselves, uh, on the one hand can be taken as, as the sort of expressions of this, what I call mnemonical status anxiety, the concern that somehow, you know, our story is yet not properly uh, recognized or, or not yet properly authoritative. So um, this, this proliferation of memory laws is not uh, something that should only be uh, studied in the domestic bounds because obviously one could ask but you know what is what is then the international relevance considering that actually you know we have a thing called territorial domestic jurisdiction and 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 why would they matter or what can they even seek to achieve um, but i guess it's precisely this international dimension that makes them so compelling uh, and interesting for the broader politics of state of seeking uh, because uh, recognition seeking fundamentally is underpinning these uh, memory laws and their proliferation. Um, and, and then there is also the element of contestation, right? Because uh, again, if we come to the regional uh, examples, um, we see how you know, certain states uh, in this triangle of Poland, Russia and Ukraine is, is fighting for uh, sort of keeping or, or reasserting its place in the existing uh, post-World War II uh, mnemonic hierarchies, whereas the others are contesting it in various ways. And, and hence, you know, we get this, this defensive and also aggressive uh, actor strategies, which are, which are very interesting in that, uh, in that regard. But then there is also a repercussion, uh, which... Uh, uh, again, brings all this sort of international signaling game, if you will, back to the domestic level, because part of the argument and part of the other sort of conceptual uh, contribution of the piece that is militant democracy is precisely to say that uh, that uh, you end up creating also a host of problems, of course, domestically when you start policing uh, the uh, uh, allowed legitimate narratives about the past. So, you know, there is this uh, potential to curb, uh, and not just potential, but actual threat to freedom of speech, um, freedom of association, uh, uh, freedom for historical research as well, which we have already seen uh, put on trial uh, in the Polish case, for instance, with the, with the court case against uh, the historians, uh, professors uh, Jan Krabowski and Barbara Engelking. So these yeah. would be the key dimensions. Yeah, no, and I think actually that's the really interesting sort of kind of point about the sort of Polish case is that it appears domestic, but it's also outward facing in terms of legislating about the external kind of representation of, of Polish past and therefore betrays a, a deep underlying anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I wonder if you can say you frame this in terms of a concept of militant democracy, drawing on the idea of militant democracy. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about what you, you know, what militant democracy is uh, and uh, why it's such a kind of useful concept for reading these kind of uh, memory laws. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, indeed, it, it sort of builds on this militant democracy template, but it also uh, highlights uh, how uh, there is a certain um, 
very fundamental distinction between the two, because you could say that uh, militant democracy, if we try to understand it uh, in a benign manner, is about the sort of basic self-defense mechanism of democracy, preemptively to make sure that the enemies of democracy would not somehow undermine the core features of democracy, such as freedom of speech. Whereas in case of militant democracy, which is something where, whereby a state mobilizes its power through proscribing memory laws that you know, criminalize, outlaw particular versions of the past that do not fit with the preferred state identity, something else is, of course, being defended there. And, and you know, this something is, is basically the good name of the state or the good name of the nation, its honor, so to speak, as defined by the particular regime or ruling elite uh, in power. I'm not, of course, suggesting that this is necessarily always enjoying uh, overwhelming societal support. Uh, again, here we have fundamental differences between, between these cases that I explored. So I think uh, where this analogy between militant democracy is productive is precisely in highlighting that in both cases, there is this um, basic danger to uh, actually not only perpetuate the very issue that uh, is supposed to be or purported to be resolved by this particular law, but also uh, endangering the very features that thereby are, are sought to be defended. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So I wonder if you, can you just extend that a bit? I mean, obviously you pointed out these kind of dangers, which I think are really interesting, but perhaps if we kind of think more on a sort of kind of, you know, sort of kind of global scale, what do we then learn about sort of status seeking strategies that states have from kind of thinking about these anxieties that this militant democracy uh, uh, discloses? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the evident uh, immediate dangers is that uh, if you try to mitigate your mnemonical anxiety via, via sort of selective amnesia, effectively, via, uh, uh, via building a certain sanitized version of your own past, you're not really resolving much. Um, that's why in this self-exculpatory dimension of uh, memory laws that we could sort of describe as, uh, as uh, giving way to militant uh, democracy, because, you know, in a way, of course, uh, we could call generally democracy um, any uh, memory law uh, or governance by memory law, because not all memory laws, of course, are punitive or problematic in that sense, restrictive in that sense. But what is really problematic there is, is uh, these laws being not only counterproductive vis-a-vis uh, -vis this very actor that is trying to legislate, you know, this, this uh, nation's or polity's memory this way or other, but also, of course, as it happens in, uh, in international security politics and ditto for international ontological security politics, they create these spirals of, of uh, insecurity. And in a way, the very triangle of Russia, Poland and Ukraine is a beautiful uh, exemplification of that because we see the sequence of, of responding to the other um, overreacting, uh, sort of replaying uh, via these memory laws, uh, the, the struggles that maybe could be more productively uh, sorted out uh, via, via historical uh, research and, and uh, you know, public discussion rather than curbing the public discussion this way. So yeah, this would that's... be the key. Sorry, carry on. No, no, that's uh, that's basically what I what I wanted to say there. So so it's it doesn't help in that sense to to uh, to uh, to not be able to see that the past uh, never uh, is is easily uh, boxable into you know just victims, just perpetrators. There is always some sort of uh, gray. Uh, going on there. And of course, there is the question of proportion, which is understandable. And, and, and one can also, you know, I guess, emotively understand uh, much of the original uh, 
uh, incentives that have been there for legalizing the memory in a particular way. Let's take the Polish case. I mean, the, the sort of very understandable frustration over this misnomer trope, Polish death camps, which is so problematic and wrong at so many levels. But then again, you know, this is also the nature of, of uh, politics that at the very end, the law that was uh, supposed to somehow do something vis-a-vis -vis using this trope actually did not even mention that trope anymore and did not have really anything palpably to do with it. Yeah, no, and I think it's really interesting that actually one of the things you point out there is that the article and my comments are framed in terms of the relationship between memory and status seeking, but actually one of the kind of things that the article draws out is the impact this has for sort of thinking about ontological security as well, so that the way in which it creates that kind of spiral of, of, of ontological insecurity, I think, you know, the article does a very effective job of, of pointing that out. Um, I, so to put you on the spot a bit, um, because everybody wants to kind of talk about it at the moment, I mean, Russia and Ukraine are very prominent kind of figures, they're two of the kind of case studies in the article. How can, you know, your kind of, um, you know, what you've, your arguments about kind of militant democracy and status seeking, how can they help us kind of um, understand a little bit more about the sort of Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, at the moment? Thanks, and that's of course uh, a very important question. And I'm, I mean, this is also one of these tragic moments where you almost wish that uh, parts of your research wouldn't be timely because uh, they they sort of get get proven to be timelier than 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 is good uh, for the world and and for Ukraine, of course, particularly now. But I guess the key element, uh, maybe, that the article helps us to see is not only that uh, the, the sort of legacy of these, uh, of these uh, contestations that very much also have framed uh, Vladimir Putin's rationale for, uh, for this full-on invasion of Ukraine now. Of course, let's not forget the war has been on for, for eight years, actually. But, uh, but I guess one needs to remember that this um, uh, nemo-political aggression, uh, when it comes to you know, the denial of uh, Ukrainian uh, state, its legitimacy, the denial of the existence of the Ukrainian nation, has been going on for quite some time. And, and thereby this memory war has actually preceded, but also fundamentally accompanied uh, the actual kinetic war. So we could, of course, ask interesting questions about, uh, you know, what sort of mobilizing role, what sort of instigating role it has served. But I guess it's very interesting to, to see how, how Putin has uh, framed this war effectively as the continuation war of the Second World War, but also in a very convoluted manner. So, you know, in the same breath, basically going out to denazify, but also uh, de- communize uh, or, or to sort of bring, bring a logical conclusion to the decommunization of Ukraine uh, when one follows uh, the, the sequence of his uh, history lectures that he has uh, given amply in, in recent years. From the Ukrainian side, I think uh, maybe what, what this current war, but also you know, this article uh, somewhat draws an attention to is that when we think of the politics of memory, uh, this is usually thought about as you know something that is that is uh, by nature uh, by default manipulative or or somehow you know strategically instrumentalizing the past. But I guess we also need to remember that the politics to to even be able to practice sovereign politics of memory is not something that distinct political actors have had an equal time or scope in, in uh, you know, the history of their existence, right? So I guess here, uh, it's interesting to see how, how this is, of course, as, uh, you know, also the Ukrainian memory laws for all their uh, flaws um, were trying to do. I mean, there is an element of self-emancipation, in a way, claiming that agency that historically has been there for so much more limited a time compared to, you know, Russia's, politically speaking, or uh, Ukraine's or other East European countries, West European counterparts.
Yeah, yeah. And actually, I think that's a really kind of key part of the article argument is the way in which we think about militant democracy as a purely kind of repressive gesture. But actually, there are also questions here about kind of emancipating uh, national uh, histories as well, which I think is, you know, you bring out really, really well. Um, okay, so one final question. Um, what are you working on now? What's what's next after after this work? Well, this still, finally enough, is, is not completely uh, finished for me. So, so in a way, we continue to explore the theme of democracy now systematically as part of the international consortium in collaboration with international human rights lawyers as a comparative study uh, of uh, various East European memory laws and then the original uh, militant democracy template, so to speak, of Germany's. So this is sort of one big, big project. And another project, which I will soon start, uh, is, is on the question of uh, ritual deterrence. And again, memory laws would have a certain uh, bearing on this question as well, because of course we can uh, think of memory laws as, as very curious, unorthodox, but nonetheless uh, deterrent devices in international politics as well. So this is something that I, I'm keen to explore further. Fantastic, we look forward to reading. Uh, we look forward to reading how you develop it from, from here. So congratulations again for winning the uh, Review of International Studies uh, Best Article Prize for the best article published in, in the review in, in 2021. Um, if viewers want to read the article, they can find the link uh, in the uh, notes below this video. And thank you very much, Maria. Thanks very much, Martin. Thank you.